Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Burns, and I am a senior lecturer in the Sydney School of Education and Social Work. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney Camperdown campus is built. As we share our knowledge tonight and our ideas about schools, teaching and learning, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within Aboriginal custodianship of country. Associate Professor Lee Wallace, Director of Sydney Social Sciences and Humanities Advanced Research Centre, also called SHARC, cannot be here tonight. And I know that she will be very disappointed to miss opening this event because she has invested a great deal of time, resources, but most significantly to the panel, enthusiasm and ideas into this event. So I want to acknowledge and thank Lee and her team for this. Um, and she is very passionate, as is the center about translating ideas, tough questions, big problems into research and research related events like this. The panel was imagined over a year ago, it's hard to believe, with Professor Jen Gilbert from York University in Canada as part of her application for the Hunt Symes Chair of Sexuality Studies at Shark. I will let Vic Rawlings, our panel chair, introduce the fabulous Jen later, but I will say a couple of things about the Hunt Symes Fellowship itself. So annually, Shark awards up to four visiting research fellowships for outstanding national or international researchers in sexuality studies to come and collaborate with researchers here at the University of Sydney in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. The fellowship is funded by the late Dr. Gary Symes, a linguistic historian, bibliographer, and University of Sydney graduate. So I will hand over to our wonderful chair, Dr. Vic Rawlings, and if you don't already know Vic, she researches at the intersections of gender, sexuality, youth, and social structures. And she is currently an Australian Research Council DECRA fellow, researching gender-based violence in schools by mobilizing community partnerships. So to you, Vic. It's really wonderful to be here as chair of this panel. Um, I, yeah, so I'll, uh, the format of tonight will be basically, we'll take about 35 to 40 minutes of um, panel questions. We also have um, an omnipotent voice that will appear from time to time, which is our fourth panelist, um, Kelly Overhaul, who's um, on Zoom with us. She couldn't be here tonight, but we're really, really thankful that she's here on Zoom, not on screen, but with us in voice. So thanks, Kelly. I hope you're not making any mean faces at me while I kind of read this out. Um, I'll start off with the person immediately to my left, Jessica Slater. She's a proud, passionate mother and stepmom living in Sydney's inner west. She lives with her partner, Byrne, from Rainbow Families New South Wales, um, who's a board member on, on Rainbow Families New South Wales. And they're, I love this description, gay Brady set of three girls. They want their children to grow up in an accepting and loving community. Professionally, Jessica is a primary school teacher in the inner city of Sydney who started her working life as a documentary maker. Before going back to school to study education, Jessica made films advocating for issues of social justice. She continues to advocate for very small people in her everyday work. And we're really thankful that you being here tonight. Um, on the very end of our panel is Jessica Fields, um, who is a sociologist um, and a professor. She's an ethnographer whose research focuses on what it means to pursue knowledge as a strategy for achieving and maintaining sexual health, to approach sexuality as something we can know, and to pursue understandings of sexuality and sexual health through formal education. Throughout her work, Jessica Fields considers the ways sexuality education routinely exacerbates the struggles of already disadvantaged young people, girls, low-income students, students of colour, and sexual nonconformists, while enfranchising the more privileged. COVID has brought a new focus to Fields' work, how a global pandemic becomes a condition in which queer, trans, racialized, and young people imagine and craft selves. The 2008 book titled Risky Lessons, Sex, Education, and Social Inequality shows incontrovertibly how qualified she is for this panel. And I also want to add that Jessica flew in from Canada, a 20-hour flight this morning, and uh, <laughs> deserves, you know, great kudos for that achievement. Well done. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. 
Um, Kelly Overhaul, who we can't see but we can hear, is a proud Wiradjuri woman from Parks in central western New South Wales. She lives on the central coast, New South Wales dark and young country with her wife and three children. Her current role in education is head teacher PDHP at Cardiff High School and she's soon to move into a corporate role within the Department of Education as a senior education officer, Aboriginal education and wellbeing advisor. Her main passion in education is the PDH, PDHPE sector and Aboriginal education. And one of her biggest achievements to date was being involved in the writing of the new current K-10 PDHPE syllabus. Her role was to write into the syllabus Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and culture content that was relevant to the PDHPE syllabus. In her new role with the department, her goal is to continue to drive Aboriginal education and ensure that our shared history is heard and understood by everyone. She wants to keep our stories alive through education and connection to country and to show what a resilient culture we truly are. Hello, Kelly. Can we hear Hi. you? Hi. Hi. Oh. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> We're stoked to have your voice here. It sounds excellent. So thanks so awesome. much for being with us. Thank you. And it's good to know that I'm not on camera. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, always a relief. And then finally, we have somewhat of a guest of honour who's brought us all together tonight. And that is Jen Gilbert, a professor of education at York University in Toronto. She's the author of Sexuality in School, The Limits of Education. Her research focuses on controversies in sex education and the experiences of queer and trans students, teachers and families in schools. She's part of the Beyond Bullying research team, which um, some of us were really lucky to hear a little bit more about earlier today. And along with Jessica Fields and Laura Mamo, and she is a 2022 Hunt Symes Visiting Chair of Sexuality Studies housed by Shark. And um, Jen has been here for about four weeks now and we never ever want her to leave. So um, we're trying to speak with Porter Force to make sure she can't leave. <laughs> um, thank you for putting up with my poor jokes. We're going to start off with a question to the whole panel and uh, we might start with you, Jen, put you in the hot seat. Um, the question is the question for the whole panel tonight, and that is, what makes sex education objectionable? Is, it, is my sound okay? Yeah? Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Vic, that, uh, for that introduction, and, and wonderful to be here with everybody. I, just before I begin, I want to say just how wonderful it's been to be here at Shark and Many, many thanks to Lee Wallace, who's not here today, and to Vic Rawlings and Kelly Burns for being such wonderful hosts. I've just had such a wonderful time, feel totally revitalized, and um, the conversations have been really enriching. So um, this panel is like a chance to continue the conversation, and I feel like I've made great new friends and colleagues, and um, Shark and Sydney have been uh, just a wonderful place to think. Um, I, we titled the panel, Why is Sex Education Objectionable? After I arrived a month ago and went to a, to a, to a panel by the other, one of the other Hunt Slimes fellows and the panel was called, Why is Sex Objectionable? And I said to Vic, oh, we should make the, we should have the panel and call it, Why is Sex Education Objectionable? But then when I came in today, I said to Jessica, this Jessica, oh, I don't, maybe I don't think it is objectionable. <laughs> and um, so I, not to refuse the question that I actually posed, but I wonder whether the framing of sex education as objectionable is as much a problem as um, we think it is. And I'm thinking here about um, two Sydney, not University of Sydney, but um, other Sydney academic colleagues, um, Jackie Ullman and Tanya Verfolge's work that shows that even in Australia, the vast majority of parents um, from across the political spectrum, support medically accurate, comprehensive, non-judgmental sex education in schools. And so, in a way, there are these flare-ups that suggest the, you know, that there is widespread controversy around sex education, but I don't think we should um, mistake that um, with the idea that people in general or parents in general find sex education objectionable. It, it finds its way onto the front page of newspapers, and that we might talk about that. Why, why is it such a combustible topic for the media, for the tabloid press? Um, but we should remember all, always that in fact, 
um, families and parents and the community at large in general support the kind of work that we're all committed to doing in schools. And um, I'll leave it there. And who should I pass to next? We might go to um, Jessica S next, because I think, you know, the, the kind of nexus is there with parents and talking about primary schools, but you might have a, a you know, your own answer that I won't put it to you. I think that what Jen is saying is, is correct in that there is some objection because if we're looking at an election in a couple of days' time and the Liberal government has wheeled out a spokesperson against trans uh, people, against all sorts of things, and I don't think that person or that party speaks for the majority of Australian parents parents do want sex education in schools and I think they do want a medical sex education but what is a medical sex education and what does that look like for five-year-olds six-year-olds 10-year-olds 12-year-olds in primary school I think it's easier in the high school where the subjects are separated and you have the PDHPE people with an excellent brand new syllabus delivering content opening up the discussion but in primary schools, our PDHPE syllabus deals with emotions. And for me, it is about language and relationships. So the primary school teacher stays with their class for the entire day. They need to build good relationships with the parents and the children. And then it's about language. Still, I hear in the hallway, boys and girls. Uh, people are, you know, there's gendered bathrooms. So I think that for primary school, it's not necessarily about sex education and sexuality, but more about gender, gender identity and relationships and language. What are we doing to um, sort of make language less gendered? Because in the way that we speak to children and with parents, your little girl, your little boy, boys and girls. I think that's more of the discussion that we're having in the early years and definitely also maybe in the upper grades. Um, it's more about gender coming into sexuality, but less about sex, sex education. Thanks, Jessica. We might, we might go straight to you, Kelly, um, seeing as we're talking about um, experiences in schools right now. Did you want to talk a little bit about your answer to this question? Yeah, sure. And I do agree with um, with uh, Jessica. We definitely have it that little bit easier. And I've got to say, I've been really lucky in that I don't think I've had any real objections to sex education that that we've that I've had to teach in my um, teaching career, which has been nice. I think the biggest thing about it, and what we try and do here in the high school setting, is just a short like reassure our parents in terms of the limitations and things that we're just trying to get our kids to make informed and safer choices around sex and um, full disclosure in my classroom we talk about everything we, we really get down to the nuts and bolts in terms of sexuality I encourage all of my students to say and 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 talk how they feel in terms of you know um, we talk about all aspects of sexuality. We talk about trans people. We talk about, you know, what would that look like in our school? Because we do have a few trans students. I personally don't address um, my kids as he or she, we're a team. So I always enter my room, you know, hi team, that sort of thing. Um, I guess one of the biggest obstacles would be, you know, some cultural beliefs and embarrassment. It's probably the biggest things that we're sort of tackling at the moment, but we are really lucky in this area that I'm in, in that, you know, we sort of have a lot of information to cover and we haven't really had a real negative experience in terms of people objecting, which has been quite nice. Thanks, Kelly. Um, super helpful to kind of see what it's like on the ground. We, we might finish off this question with Jessica Fields, who's going to finish, finish the question for us. Okay, I'll uh, make room for objection then. So uh, first I'll make room for an objection that isn't often heard. And that's the objection from the perspective of the queer parent who 
often doesn't see themselves represented in sex education. Often when we have these panels, when we bring people together, I don't object at all to what you're doing in the classroom, but what's happening in most classrooms is actually quite objectionable, right? There's an incredibly heteronormative, racist, classist vision of what sexuality might look like in our communities. And I object. That's not the objection that's usually heard in the newspapers or in the political debates, and there isn't much room for it. So then I would approach the question another way and to think about the word objectionable. And so I would think, well, why is it that sex ed is the thing to which we are able to object? Right? Why is it that there's so much room for us to take up so much space in political debates in our political economies around sex education? Why is it that on the backs of young people, on the landscape of public education, we can devote so much time to sex education, which really is such a small portion of what's happening in schools. It's actually such a small portion of where young people are learning about sexuality, and yet we invest so much. So it's, I then suspect it's not really about sex education. There are these other objections that we can bring to the four through our argument about sex education. So I think what we're really arguing about is the composition of families, about gender roles, about the room for trans people in our world, about how we allocate resources, who we recognize as having a meaningful life. And the way we can do that is through sex education. Right? But there isn't as much room for those other objections that we might have. So I think we have to be suspicious of why people are doing it through sex education, why we're asking sex education to do so much work, not only in schools, but just culturally. Why is this object the thing to which we object? It'd be cool if you actually like just dropped, dropped the mic after that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if our audio friend would allow us to do that. So we'll refrain from the moment, but maybe later when there's another really amazing answer. Um, thank you so much. And I wanted to kind of turn back towards the classroom. We feel super lucky tonight to have two experienced teachers who are facing the realities of talking about gender, sexuality, sex every day on this panel. And I wanted to come back to Jessica S for a second. Um, one of the things we're thinking about is um, primary schools. They're often targeted in terms of the media, in terms of discourse around age appropriateness, about which kinds of conversations or lives can exist in these spaces. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about what you think are the important conversations that need to happen about gender and sexuality in the classroom. Thank you. I think as a queer parent also that there, there are, it is, sex education is objectionable. And I think what the first question we need to ask in primary schools is, we tend to invite um, in New South Wales, a lot of outside organisations into our schools to deliver messages, usually around PDHPE, so personal development, health and physical education. We invite these organisations in. Healthy Harold is a long-standing one. Um, it's a giraffe that comes in and talks to you about drugs and alcohol and ways of being safe. With a giraffe on a lady's hand, that lady usually nips around the corner at recess for a small smoke and um, it's objectionable. Um, I know that we bring in an organisation for our primary school students and I work at a very diverse school, um, an inclusive school. Uh, we bring in this organisation who talk to our kids about sex education and one of the um, gabies piped up and said, well, I'd really like it if you would stop using the terms mum and dad and start using the term parent because I've got two mums and, and the presenter was like, I get it, I get it. You were born in a, you were, you were created in a test tube. And she's like, no, I wasn't. And it was just shut down. And I think it comes back to that idea of language and relationships. It's about what kind of language are we using? That presenter probably didn't know how to talk about that. Did they have the education around the language to use with those 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds in that situation? Probably not. And she had to shut it down. But also it's about those relationships. So the relationships between the school and the organisations that they're bringing in. Do their values match the values that we have? Do they match the mission statement of the new PDHPE syllabus? Are we... Do our relationships with parents support the organisations that we're bringing in? What about the student voice? 
what do the students and the children think about who we're bringing into their schools and what they're saying? So for me, in a primary school situation, it's about building the relationships and the language that we use. And it's very difficult because if you've got, say, a person that's been to a religious school until they're 18, they go straight into a university setting to study teacher education for four years, and then they go into a school. They've never met a queer person. They don't know about language. They don't know about trans people or any of those things. So where is the education for them? Does it start in teacher education? Does it, is it in schools, in professional development, talking about the differences between people and or the unity between people? I don't know. For me as a teacher, it's about language and being careful with my language and not using boys and girls. I have, for an example, I teach a year one class. There is currently a student that has asked to go by they and them. And they were uh, using the boys' toilets. That was their choice. And one of the older teachers was mortified by this and said, everybody is going to become confused. We don't, this person has to use the toilet of their gender. And it was like, what difference does it make? The kids don't mind. It doesn't matter. So this child now has to use the staff toilets, which are gender neutral because of the prejudices and the language use of the staff at the school. So I think the relationships, the language are the first things that we need to consider in primary schools if we're thinking about sex education and gender identity. Thanks, Jessica. Um, it's good to start hearing conversations about initial teacher education and how universities can play a role in the kind of talking about um, sex education um, and hopefully talking about why Australia is probably the only country where children learn about sex in a dark caravan with a giraffe puppet. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that could be a slogan from tonight. There's nothing healthy about Harold. Um, Kelly, we're going to come to you now, um, seeing as we're talking about what it looks like on the ground for teachers and the kinds of things that are happening in schools. Um, and I've got the same kind of question for you here. What are the important conversations that need to happen in high schools around sexuality and gender? And, you know, we, we know that you work really, you do amazing work around especially First Nations people's knowledge. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to kind of tie some of that in as well. Total option, of course. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I will. I, Jess, I absolutely agree with, um, with what you were saying with the primary school as well. Um, my, I had an incident with my daughter um, and one of her friends, she's seven, I've got a seven-year-old daughter at the skate park and I gave her some instructions and then her other mother came and gave her some instructions and then her little friend said, well, you know, who's that woman? And she's like, well, that's my mum. And then the other one goes, but isn't that your mum? And she's like, well, yeah, that's my mum too. I've got two mums. And he kept asking her the question, which one is your real mum? And she's like, well, I don't understand what you're trying to say. And then he goes, no, well, which one is your real mum? And she, and I was so proud of her with her response because she said, she goes, oh, do you mean which one's vagina did I come out of? Hers and pointed to my wife. And then that solved that conversation. So, and I use that um, as a bit of an icebreaker in, because I'm actually teaching uh, sex health in the, with year 10 at the moment. We're looking at consent and things like that. And um, I think the important conversations that need to happen around you know, sexuality and gender is that we need to just make it, it's normalised for everybody. Like the conversations that we're having in class and some of them are really deep. Like there's some kids that really want to delve into, they want to know how to use pronouns correctly. They want to know, um, you know, what some people say, well, what does sex look like for a same sex couple? I was like, well, you know, we don't really need to talk about that. But um, we, we do talk about um, when we're talking about safe sex, I talk about safe sex for, for straight people, for lesbian people, for what am I look like for a trans person, because there's often somebody in that classroom who hasn't come out, who is choosing, who hasn't, you know, made clear what their identification is. And it might just be that little tiny bit of knowledge that we share 
and the response that happens in the class that makes them feel more comfortable. So I guess um, the big thing that the big conversations that we try and drive around sexuality and gender is that um, we really want to try and address all those mental health concerns that are arising because of this, you know, kids not feeling safe. Um, a very inclusive classroom is what we're going for. Like I said, informed, safer choices. The big thing that we're looking at at the moment is consent. I'm not sure if you saw um, that ridiculous department resource that was released recently with the milkshake thing it was oh my year 10 class absolutely went off their head over that and when they found out how much money was spent on it they're like we could do our own video so that's what we did we made our own video on consent and what that looked like and some of the kids were coming at it from you know a trans perspective some people were coming at it from a straight perspective um, and then we put them all together and we had this really nice set of resources that we can now use down the track so I guess the big conversation that needs to happen around sexuality and gender in, in schools is you know we want to normalize it I don't want to make it we don't want to make it that it has to be this big thing where you know, sometimes we say the wrong thing, but as long as we, you know, acknowledge that we've said the wrong thing or, you know, ask the person what they want to be called or what they want to be identified as, I feel like that's a step in the right direction. Um, some of the kids in our school will say that they prefer to be called they, them, or, you know, um, he or she. And I tend to um, make sure that they feel comfortable with myself using that. The kids will also use it as well. So I guess um, what we're sort of trying to do is make sure that we hold on to those moral codes and we're really sort of mirroring um, our, our um, curriculum for a bit broader perspective, if that sort of makes sense. So just taking it away from the simple, you know, we're talking about periods and all that sort of stuff to, um, you, like you said, feelings, relationships, safe choices, um, and the big driving force is that whole mental health is what is the biggest thing that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with the kids in our in our age group. So um, culturally, we've got over 140 Aboriginal kids at my current school. Um, a lot of them, in terms of like you know, there, there are certain cultural um, Aboriginal beliefs in regards to to sex education and things like that. I mean, statistically, if you look at the STDs and you know, transmittable diseases and things are so much higher in remote Indigenous communities. And so we need to be making sure that we're, you know, educating everybody, not only our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, in regards to, to not only safer sex, but making those safer choices and things like that. So we can, you know, decrease these statistics and essentially close those gaps. Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Great to hear from you. And I think it's a, we're hearing like a really key, key themes coming from both of the teachers in this, you know, what kind of language use is being used, how people's identity is being supported, how can people talk about things respectfully in classrooms. But there's other conversations going on, right? There's conversations that are happening in sex education research circles. So Jessica, I have a, a question for you, which is what kind of conversations do you think sex education researchers should be having? now it's on okay <laughs> okay um thanks for the question I, i'm struck by the call for teacher education and because so many of the people doing teacher education are also researchers so there's an, an interesting intersection between those two groups and so many of the researchers thinking about sex education are white right when the group of sex education scholars gets together it's usually a pretty white room and that's interesting and troubling so why is that because in part it's troubling because it means that the people providing the teacher education are often white so if we think about the responsibility of preparing people to think about the needs in different communities to understand the way that racism threads its way through this the way that settler logics thread their way through this like how how much capacity do we have and part of this problem to really prepare teachers and support teachers in doing that. So that's one reason that it concerns me. And the other is that, you know, we often imagine that we need to fix it. So, you know, I need to put together a volume as a researcher. So I want to make sure that the table of contents is diverse, right? So I need to bring people in. But there's something strange about imagining that I've been handed the problem that I then need to fix. 
as opposed to understanding that I helped to make the problem. So how is the whiteness of the field the product of the way we approach the questions? Why is it that more people of color, racialized people, indigenous people don't feel invited into the conversation as a scholarly question? Is it something about the way the field's been centered around questions of desire? Do those not travel in the same way? Is there something about, there's a fundamental faith in education that seems to organize sex education research, this idea that good learning could happen in the schools, but maybe the institution itself is just fundamentally broken. And so white people continue to have some faith in it because it hasn't failed us in the same way. And others just aren't gonna go there, right? It's not the place to go for meaningful learning. So I really wanna think about this. I wanna figure out as a field, not just how to fix the problem, but how we've helped to make the problem. And in part because of the teacher education, right? If, the, if people are looking to that preparation as a way to do the work differently, it has consequences. It's not just about the table of contents or who's on the panel. It's also about the work that we're able to support people doing on the ground. Thanks, Jessica. I really appreciate that. And my, my last question for our panelists is for Jen. And again, you know, she should have dropped the microphone, right? It's tough. Um, I'll, the question for you, Jen, I mean, we were really lucky earlier today to hear about the work that Jen is doing directly with young people and children. And I'd really like to hear a little bit from you about what you think they are talking about, what they think that they need um, from um, questions about sexuality and gender in and around schools or beyond them. Well, now I'm like rethinking my answer after Jessica's answer. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not in schools. Um, and, but I think it's a good, I actually, it's, I think it's a really good question, a good segue, sorry. Um, because I think that um, when we think about sex education for young people, we tend as adults, as teachers, as educators, even as researchers, we tend to imagine, we get really focused on like, what are students learning? How, how are they receiving those lessons? When should we receive, when should they receive the, like, when are they going to learn about gender identity? I don't, in Ontario, Canada, where we're, uh, where I'm from, there was a big controversy because gender identity was mentioned in grade three. And that was seen as indoctrinating. And, you know, in the whole discourse of grooming right now, this is seen as somehow actually corrupting children as opposed to um, as opposed to supporting them. But I think one of the things that I've learned through uh, my research and my colleagues' research is that young people's understanding of sex and gender, and I, I guess this goes to Kelly's comments too, young people's understanding of sex and gender is so much more sophisticated than our sex education gives them credit for. So we imagine, I think sex education fundamentally has this idea that you know, its job is to educate young people out of homophobia, educate them out of transphobia and into these more tolerant stances and inclusive stances where, where in fact, you know, our research shows that young people, even if they don't themselves identify as LGBTQ, they have um, important relationships with queer and trans people. They have uncles and aunts or a pastor or a neighbor or they watch TV or they, you know, listen to music. Um, by queer artists. And so the idea that schools are responsible for giving young people information about sexuality and gender, especially, seems really backwards. What would it mean for sex education to start thinking about young people as themselves experts and, and to meet them on the, that terrain instead? I, I, I mean, I think this would be one way to rethink the function of sex education as less about educating people into particular um, sexualities and genders and orientations and more that there's a different kind of conversation that could happen in schools because school, as you said in your earlier comments, Jessica, schools are not the place where young people are having their most important conversations about sexuality and gender in, in what do you call it? H, you say that PDHB. active, PDHBA is like so fast, it's like its own word now. You know, that's like, really, and, you know, when you talk to anybody, does anyone say, I've never met anyone who said, oh, my God, my sex education was so fantastic. <laughs> I really learned how to X, Y, Z. No. So, but if that's the case, then maybe there's something else that we could do in sex education that is more in line with what the strengths of education are. And um, so I, I think young people are, you know, 
they we're not giving them the sex education they need because they know more than us, you know, on, on in so many ways, but they do still need us. So I think, you know, the conversations that Kelly's describing having with her students, you know, sound really meaningful. And they, they're sort of driven, it sounds like, Kelly, I don't know if I'm putting words into your mouth, but they sound like they're actually driven by young people's interests and curiosities and, the, and their sense of their ambitions for themselves. And I think that that would be, um, you know, kind of turn sex education a little bit on its head. It's a wonderful segue, Jen, into our last question that I'm going to invite everyone on the panel to talk about. And I'm just thinking about what you're saying that sometimes teachers and other educators can be a little bit stumped when certain things come up in the classroom or around the classroom and um, the students are in a different space or place to them bringing those things up. So I'd like to invite everyone. We might start off with you, Jessica S, just because you're next to me so I can pick on you. Um, what is one question a student has asked you that has stumped you, surprised you, or caught you off guard? And we'll ask this to all the panelists and then we'll have some questions after that. I guess I'm in a unique situation that I teach at the place where my two children and my stepchild go. And I try to incorporate um, sort of gender, non specific language in all of my. Um, teaching but one child asked me reading a book and it was around Mardi Gras and I always do the rainbow flag and I do a few books around that time and I say watch out for me on the telly we have a float I'll be there and during this discussion somebody said but who's the dad and I'm like well there is no dad but but who, who which one of you is the dad or who's the dad and so, therefore, I said, what do you mean by that? And it was the discussion. It was a curly question. I didn't try to answer it. I said, what do you mean by that? And what does everybody else think? This is my family. Here's the photo. Um, these two children, they have a dad. And this one doesn't. She has three mums in varying degrees. What do you all think about that? And six-year-olds can have discussions just like 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, when you put it back to them and you give the students a voice and the children a voice, and just like Jen was saying, they know way more than us, even at six. Their access to content is ridiculous. The stuff that they see, even if they are slightly restricted with their internet access, they see so much content. They have so much to offer. And so you just, okay, so what, what do we think about this? What and you know, how, how does this work? Well, I have at home a grandmother, you know, I have some Chinese students who have the whole range. There's an auntie, there's a grandmother, there's a grandfather. Then there's another family where there's one child at home, but the other child's in China. So it opens up those discussions about what does a family look like and who plays those roles? What are the roles in that family? But I think it's about the children's voice, the student voice and opening it up and not being afraid as a teacher, not shutting it down, just asking, what do you think? And then also you get that diversity in a classroom. There's a lot of diversity in my classroom and it's, then you get everyone's perspective and then you can discuss it. And yeah, there are some really tricky questions. I won't tell you the one about when you're cutting out the catalogs to learn about money and somebody says that's my dad's favorite drink pointing to the johnny walker because i've heard it all <laughs> lack of filter often in primary school kids am i right i love it I'm a little bit like mine um all right let's go on to kelly if you're still with us uh what's the question that a student has asked you that stumped you okay so oh, i'll tell you about the students ones but just recently I had a, a conversation with my four, I've got four year old twins and they were both sitting on the lounge recently watching Paw Patrol. My son, uh, one of the twins put his hand down his pants and was just starting to play with himself a little bit. I just let it go. I'm, like, I'm just gonna go over here and give him a bit of time. Unfortunately, he was sitting next to his twin sister at the time. And, you know, he pulled down his pants a little bit and he's turned to his sister. He's like, Riley, look what I've just made. And he was so excited with this. and. You know, her being the encouraging twin was like, oh, good job, Flinny. That's such a, I'm so proud of you. 
And um, I'm having a little giggle to myself as, as you guys are now. And then I was like, all right, buddy, maybe we don't do that out here in the lounge room. That's something that we go and do in our room. And he said, well, come on, Riley, let's go to my room. I'm like, oh, no, not you and Riley, just you. Um, and so recently I've sort of been opening up with that in, in, our, um, in our classes and we're talking about in year 10 at the moment. The, the question that really stumped me was to, there was one that had come from one of the female students who actually asked if I could check if her tampon was in correctly once. Um, of course, didn't do that. And another one was, um, um, could I uh, demonstrate in masturbation and things like that? Um, we talk about it being a safe thing and something that everybody does and they shouldn't be embarrassed about it. And that's, I sort of come at it from that direction. I was like, obviously, we're not going to stand up here and, you know, everyone practice together. That's not what we do. Um, but try to make it with this group of people, with this group of young kids, you know, they're 15, 16 year old girls uh, and boys, that it's a safe thing and that everybody does it and they shouldn't feel embarrassed by that. You know, and I really try and um, in terms of these, um, the, the conversations and the questions, really try and encourage kids to stay in contact with their parents, like, you know, keep them informed about the things that are happening, you know. Um, one of the things that we really talk about as well is, um, is our virginity. And, you know, I'll try and say to some of our students, like, this is something that you have a big choice around and it's only your choice and you need to be the person that makes that choice. And I'll often, you know, say, you can't just go to Coles and grab another virginity off the choice, off the shelf, you know, that's it. Once it's gone, it's sort of gone and it should be something that you remember and is beautiful and special. And, you know, so then we'll have that conversation around, um, you know, well, how do you make it special? Like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, that's not something that it's not special for me. It's for you to determine. And it's about, like you said, putting that ownership back on them. So, yeah, I guess the big things, um, the big curly questions, and we um, as a PE staff always invite kids to put questions um, in a box that we can answer uh, anonymously. We read them out. We answer them. Some are a little bit, you know, um, trying to, to make fun of or something like that. And if those questions come across, we don't even acknowledge them. But you know, the ones where people are genuinely asking information in an anonymous sense so that they can have some sort of um, be educated on that is something that we've found works really, really well in our classes. Kelly, we might go straight to you, Jessica Fields. The answer is a researcher. And part of what's interesting about the question is that um, as a researcher, young people don't ask me a lot of questions. I ask them a lot of questions. So that's just interesting to me. But I did recently have an experience of a young person asking me a question. Uh, so we're doing interviews for a study that's in Australia, the States and Canada about young, queer and racialized um, people's experiences of risk in the context of COVID. And we're interviewing young people. I was interviewing a young person in New York and um, at the end of every interview, we say, you know, if you want to get in touch with us again, you're always welcome to. So I've been conducting interviews for, I don't know, like 30 years or something, a really long time. And I think it was for the very first time someone contacted me after the interview. So this young person reached out and said, can we talk? And I panicked, like just the question itself, just, I, I just didn't even know what that would mean, right? What can we talk? And so I wrote back, um, sure, let me know some good times. It's all over email. And they never wrote back to me. And the question was so, it was so striking to me that they took me up on the offer to talk, right? And so, I, and, and it just struck me that I had always said this 30 years, I've said it so many times. Someone finally said, okay. <laughs> right? And I didn't, and it made me nervous. I didn't know what the conversation was going to be. And then now what I'm struck by is one, how, like, how much have, have I meant it, right? When I've said that, made that gesture, how much of it is just about the research ethics board insisting that I do it? What does it mean to really sit in that offer? But also I'm really struck by how she stays on my mind now. So I think about her a lot and I wonder if she'll still email me. And I wonder what it means for us to have this connection, right? There's just some way that her asking if she could talk to me and initiating the conversation set something else up. And 
I, I don't know, I like it. I like the way it makes me think about what it means to be a researcher with young people and to think about what my relationship to them might be and, and why might a person reach out to me? I think that the assumption in the REB's mind is that they are um, unhappy or traumatized or need counseling after the interview, right? That there's some risk that hasn't been addressed and they need somewhere to bring their problem. But maybe that's not what she needed, right? Maybe she just had something else she wanted to talk to. The, the email didn't sound distressed. It just sounded like she wanted to talk again. Um, so I'm, I'm, and I, as I was listening to you, Kelly, I was thinking about the ways that questions are so relational. Like there's something about asking a teacher to see whether their tampons incorrectly or, you know, that it's also about witnessing. And of course you're going to say no, right? Of course, that's not a, something that you can say yes to, but there is something about asking someone to witness you and to help you. That's just, I don't know, the questions are sort of beautiful. And, and what does it mean to be a researcher who's not often the object of the questions, right? And that we are so often asking others to answer our questions, especially as an adult, right? What does that mean to always do that? So wherever this person is, they've stirred me up and I sit here in my quiet agitation <laughs> waiting for their email. Yeah. Dan? I know, I'm, not, no, I'm like, I, I'm thinking about, um, yeah, no one asked me questions either, really. So, but I was thinking about, I have been writing, uh, thinking about the idea of the question box. So it's sort of interesting, Kelly, that you brought it up because I was going to say that, um, and I might offer a slightly different slant on the question box. Um, we did a, um, myself and some colleagues in Toronto did a study of um, HPE teachers in Canada after we had a controversy around sex education. And then we interviewed a bunch of teachers to say, all right, like, what's it like to teach sex ed in the context of these controversies? And so many of the teachers talked about the question box and they sort of uh, where, you know, you have a box in the corner, it's anonymous, you can write a question, deposit at any time. And then those questions, the idea was those questions would become the grounds of the conversation in sex ed and teachers would just like, they love the question box, right? And they would be like, the question box is a space of freedom. It's a space where kids can really be themselves. It means that they're able to bring their truest self into the room, except then when we would talk to them, okay, well, what do you do? Well, they would get the questions, they would weed through them and throw out half of them that were like, they felt were inappropriate. And then when they felt like their, their students hadn't asked the right questions, they'd insert their own questions into the question box. You know, so it became actually a space of, of controlling the classroom discourse around sexuality, much more than only opening it up. And so I'm wondering how I, I've, listening to everyone, I'm thinking about the, the role of questions in sex education. I think teachers, for lots of good reasons, feel really nervous about questions, you know, because as Kelly mentioned, and this, this um, comes across in the research with teachers, students in sex education, it's such an interesting space in the school, they do ask questions that can be quite almost like a tests, you know, like, will you show me how to masturbate or you know, so I, I'm interested now that you've talked about that relational quality, that's interesting because the, the relation is the quality of that relation is also can be kind of like a bit aggressive, you know, like, yeah, you say you want to talk about sex. All right, you know, or um, and so the question I'm thinking about the question box is a place not so much for only opening up conversations, but also a way for teachers to feel prepared and to kind of structure and contain the the conversation in sex education. Needless to say, we've had our own structured and contained question box happening through the night on Zoom. <laughs> and I believe Hannah has some highly edited questions for us. Oh, okay. Well, I feel nervous. So here we go. What, what, what if you, I can, we can bring you a little mic because we've got one up here. And then we'll take, maybe we'll take one from the floor after that as well. Um, so the first question um, was, um, I'd be interested to hear the panel speak about the role of teaching about pleasure as part of sex education um, and the role of incorporating, incorporating porn literacy into sex education classes. To any member of the panel. 
I pass it over to Kelly. Yeah. Just because you're in a high school, and I, I can imagine conversations about porn and it are part of what you're talking about. So do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do, um, we do talk about sex for pleasure. And like I said earlier, that it must be like, it, it should be something that's pleasurable for you. And we talk about, you know, unrealistic expectations that people come across in porn, you know, like we do, obviously we don't show it or anything like that, but we do talk about, um, you know, especially some of the young males in the class will tend to be like, oh, well, I saw this. And, you know, um, we try and basically reassure everybody that not everybody's first time having sex or everybody's sex life is like a porn um, video or a porn, something that you watch on, on online. But we do really try and incorporate, um, you know, that it, it should be pleasurable and it should be fun and it shouldn't be considered something that's, you know, dirty or not that they should be doing it, you know, as long as they're making sure that they're safe and that it's on their terms and, um, you know, that there's consent and that both parties are consenting. Um, but, yeah, we do try and um, not normalise it but address that it, it's something that we're dealing with and um, that not everything is going to look like a, a porn movie, if that makes sense. Vic, can I also talk to that? Um, although I teach younger children, we have had some, I guess, issues with children pleasuring themselves in the classroom during classroom time, the corner of the desk. Um, and we've had to have those conversations with, it's usually girls actually finding something and going, oh my gosh, this feels really, really good. And having to have those conversations with not only the child, but also the other class members, yes, it feels good, but it's distracting for you right now and it's pleasurable. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but at the moment we are doing this and it's distracting for you and for other children. It's been interesting and I, um, in my role of head of infant school or head of K-2, having to talk with other teachers where they've witness this and not knowing what to say they're like how can I talk about that that child's masturbating on the corner of the table and it's like well it's they don't know that term they're just having a rub and thinking it feels really good so just say it's distracting how can I help you to be focused on what we're doing in the classroom but not take away from the fact that that child is feeling absolute pleasure from the corner of that wooden desk I'm going to steal the limelight from our wonderful teachers. And I've got a question, I think, mainly for Jessica and Jen here. And this is from the wonderful head of school of Sydney School of Education and Social Work, Deb Hayes, who's on the line. Uh, she says, um, almost 40 years ago, as a beginning science teacher, I invited a family planning educator into my class to basically give girls information about how not to get pregnant. It was radical sex education at the time. This conversation demonstrates how much has changed. What do you think this conversation might look like in 40 years' time? <laughs> I'm such an empiricist. I think questions like this are very difficult for me. Um, I know you probably do. I know I'm actually that. like 40 years. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that the, I think one, it's beautiful to imagine it will look different, right? So I think that that's really humbling and important for educators who hold the role of, of knowing and to just know best that whatever we're doing now will be inadequate to 40 years from now and that we'll be called into something else. So we have to approach it that way. That feels important to not, to maybe not to know. And maybe I could say what I hope it looks like rather than what it will look like. Um, I think, I hope that it, I think that the racial composition of the conversation, I hope shifts profoundly. I hope that we are more, um, I guess I, I would say something about the porn literacy question, because I'm really struck by how it's impossible for a teacher to be sexual, a sexual being in the classroom, even though they're really the only representative of adult sexuality in the room, which is what you're talking about, right? You're usually anticipating something. And porn literacy is so fascinating because usually when we talk about literacy, we assume that the teacher is literate which means that we assume the teacher watches porn, I guess, in this case, which is absolutely impossible for the teacher to say, in my experience watching porn, here's the way to view it, here's what I've learned, right? So it's impossible. But of course, that means that they're illiterate. So how are they teaching 
poor in literacy if they're in fact illiterate. So I would, I guess what I would hope in 40 years is that we've made room for the teacher to be a sexual being in the room and to have privacy and protection from all of the violence and harassment that might come their way because of the that, but that we have made room for teachers to be full beings inside the classroom. I know, I just can't keep following you. It's, it's too hard. I mean, I, because I don't, I mean, I'm very interested more in what's happened in the last 40 years and the ways in which, you know, we, we tend to think of sex education as such a progress, like we're progressing to the next best thing. When in fact, you know, my sense of the conversations that were happening as part of sex education, say in the late seventies in Canada, um, were really progressive. We're really about expanding gender roles. We're really about you know, kind of on the heels of the sexual revolution, trying to understand what it would mean to be um, growing up as a girl and not having only one path available for you as you finish school. I mean, I think that that was really a, a kind of open conversation that feels like we sort of lost that in some ways. And I think even on the heels of HIV AIDS, that there was conversations about pleasure and practices that weren't tied to particular identities that you know, people were really working to detach um, certain behaviors from certain people and quote unquote risk groups. And I think that we sort of lost that ethic. So I think, I hope, I don't know what it will look like in 40 years, but I'm excited to, I, I guess, I don't want to assume that it will be better either because I can see that we've lost things now, even though there are some things that are much better. And I, just to kind of go, I know we're, we're running out of time, but I wanted to make sure to say, in terms of the giraffe issue. Um, and um, is that, you know, there are, I do know, and I've learned since being here for the month, that there are some really great organizations that are doing important work in schools around, especially around um, sexual, sexuality and gender inclusivity. And I had a great chance to talk to the, one of the co-executive um, directors of 2010, which is, I think we're gonna throw the link up in the, um, in the chat. And they're doing really great work, both in and out of schools. And so, you know, maybe we don't have to always have the giraffe, you know, and we can have, you know, real live breathing sexual beings come in. And, and because sometimes schools do need those resources. I mean, obviously, we always want schools to be able to have the capacity to offer those programs and those lessons themselves and to build that capacity within their own staff. But when that's not possible... Um, thank God there's places like 2010. I think that could be a perfect place to finish. And in the spirit of Lee Wallace, I would hate to go over time. I know. We're two um, minutes early. We can tell her. <laughs> um, I just want to say a really generous and deep thank you to all of the panellists tonight. Um, you've all done a terrific job opening up our minds and dialogues about why sex education is or isn't objectionable. We can continue to debate that. Um, thanks everyone for joining online as well and for attending tonight um, in person. Apologies, there wasn't more time for questions, but um, I, I also want to just send out a really um, big thanks to Kelly Burns, who helped facilitate tonight's panel, um, and Lee Wallace, who couldn't be here. Um, we we um, definitely are feeling her presence anyway, but thanks everyone for being involved. And Nanda as well has been a terrific tech and just organisation support. Hannah Hayes and Aisha at the back too, and um, the amazing shark support staff. We really appreciate it. So thank you so much. We hope to see you again.